One, art. Art is the first sphere of absolute spirit, of the absolute ideas, knowledge of itself as the unity of subject and object, form and content. Art contemplates the idea in its first immediate sensuous form. This is the idea or the ideal as beauty. There are three particular forms of art, symbolic, classical, and romantic, all linked to particular religions, and five individual arts, architecture, sculpture, painting, music, and poetry, a series that transitions from outer to inner. Every work of art has two sides, its spiritual content and its material sensuous embodiment or form. As to the three forms of art, in the symbolic form, linked, e.g., to Hinduism and Egyptian religion, matter dominates over spirit. In the classical form, linked to Greek religion, matter and spirit are in equilibrium and perfect harmony. In the romantic form, linked to the Christian religion, spirit dominates matter. And here we have the transition to religion, to pure spirit and inwardness. In brief, in the symbolic art of sublimity, there is not yet a unity of the two sides of the work of art, of the spiritual content, the meaning or thought, and its material embodiment or form. Here the shape, the embodiment suitable to the idea, is not yet found. The material shape is just a symbol that suggests a meaning but cannot express it. As Hegel says, quote, the content is only the abstract God of pure thinking, like light or Brahma, or a striving towards him, a striving without rest or reconciliation, which throws itself into shape after shape, like the pyramids, sphinx, huge Memnon statues, and obelisks, because it cannot find its goal." End quote. Here we do not yet have the self-consciousness of free spirit, as with the Greeks, for the symbolic regards the external, natural, and material as independent and not as a mere expression of spirit. As for the sublime, it is, in brief, the attempt to express the infinite without being able to find a sensuous medium adequate to express it. <clears throat> in classical art, in the Greek statue of a god, we have a perfect unity and match between the spiritual content and its embodiment. Hence, for the first time, a beautiful work of art. Among the given forms of nature, the human is the supreme form in which alone the spirit can be sensuously embodied. For the Greeks, the divine is no longer an abstract god, an empty universality, but a spiritual individuality. The God is a personal, individual being like ourselves.
Hence, anthropomorphism is the main feature of classical art. In the statue of the god, the outward form perfectly expresses the inner content. Hence, in classical art, art reaches its perfection. Romantic art occupies a higher stage of spirit than classical art, but only because it will transcend art completely and pass to the higher sphere of religion. In romantic art, spirit predominates over matter, and this is because its basis is the Christian religion in which the idea and spirit are fully revealed, albeit in the inadequate form of picture thinking, not the concept. Hence, because spirit is superior to and above nature, it is known that nature, matter, the sensuous can never be a true embodiment of spirit. As Hegel says, romantic art, quote, presents the divine as inwardness in the externality from which it disengages itself, end quote. Hence, here we begin to transcend art altogether. As to the five individual arts which express the idea of beauty in a sensuous form and which transition from outer to inner, matter to spirit, in brief. One, architecture, the primary symbolic form of art, takes as its medium solid matter in its three dimensions, governed by the mechanical laws of gravity and in buildings exhibiting symmetry, equality, and conformity to rule. The symbolic building exists as an independent end in itself, unlike the Greek temple whose end is not itself but the statue of the god within it. Two, sculpture, the primary classical form of art. It still has matter in its three dimensions as its medium and takes the organic human form as its basis. The statue of a god is a perfect unity of spiritual content and material form. Three, note that Hegel considers painting, music, and poetry as the primary arts of the romantic form, which gradually transcend art's sensuous embodiment. Thus, painting, expresses the idea of beauty in just two dimensions, with the first negation of space, i.e. of its dimension of depth. Hence, its basis is no longer heavy, solid matter. It only has the appearance or illusion of such matter. Painting's illusion of depth is created by its material medium of light and color, mainly by the differentiation of color. Painting is limited in that it can only portray a single moment of time, which is not the case with music and poetry. For music expresses beauty through the medium of sound, thus completely negating space and its three dimensions, and existing only 
in time. Hence, music is a purely subjective art as compared with architecture, sculpture, and painting. There is no separation between the work of art and its beholder. Five, poetry is completely inner and subjective and transcends the senses altogether. Its medium is words, images, and ideas. It is the universal art and contains all the others. Any content, whatever the mind is able to think, can be the content of poetry. Poetry has three main types. Epic poetry, whose principle is objectivity, where the poet is just a narrator of events and actions taking place in an objective world of persons and things. The Iliad and the Odyssey are examples of this. Lyrical poetry, whose principle is subjectivity, where the inward life of the poet finds expression, not the outward form of events, namely the poet's private feelings, moods, joys, or sorrows. Examples are Emily Dickinson and E. E. Cummings. Finally, dramatic poetry is the unity of lyrical and epic, subjectivity and objectivity. Objective as it presents a series of events in the outward world. Subjective as the outward action is developed through the inward life of the characters expressed in speech. There are three types. Tragedy, which involves a conflict between forces which are each ethically justifiable, e.g. Antigone, Macbeth, and a doll's house. Comedy, which in effect justifies ethical worth by exposing the hollowness of whatever is worthless. For example, the comic character can aim at an end which is empty and vain and which thus collapses and comes to naught, e.g. Laurel and Hardy. And modern drama is a social play which combines tragedy and comedy such that the tragic collision is so weakened that the result is a harmony of ends and individuals. For example, Pygmalion and My Fair Lady. Thus, in drama and poetry as a whole, art as such is transcended. Spirit has totally withdrawn from the side of sensuous material embodiment and has now passed on to religion. In brief, freedom is attainable in art in that in the presence of a work of art, you lose yourself and become one with the object, the infinite beauty, the idea. Indeed, art was a form of worship, especially to the Greeks and Romans. With art, we move from the temporal and finite to the eternal and infinite and your true self. Of course, in art, you cannot achieve permanent union with the idea. Only in religion and philosophy can you do so.